Hi, this is Mike Shackelford, also known as the Wizard of Oz, with part two of my series on PyGal. In this video, we will focus on the strategy, which in PyGal is very complicated. I wish I could say there's a simple strategy that gets you close to the optimal strategy, but there just isn't. I have um, three strategies on my website and various degrees of complexity that strive to get you fairly close to optimal without too much memorization involved. Nevertheless, um, strategy in PyGao is, is just difficult. It, you just have to accept the challenge. And, and frankly, that's why I like this game because it is so challenging and um, um, it's not always playing like a robot like I do with Blackjack in the basic strategy. So um, in this, I'm going to just try to go through some rules of thumb. Um, I'm not going to Try to give you a specific strategy but just some general pointers and I would refer to you refer you to my website Wizard of Odds uh, for a more complete strategy in case I forget anything so let's talk about the pairs first it's always a good place to start most of the time if you get a if you get a two pair it's obvious that you're gonna keep that together but if you have one pair most of the time you'll still retain it together but sometimes the odds favor splitting it apart if the other two tiles other than the pair make for a very low hand. Um, so Tess, which, according to the house way, which pairs should you never split? Fours, fives, sixes, tens, and elevens. All right. Um, I would, if my advice would be to never split fours, tens, or elevens but I would sometimes split fives and sixes. Uh, the math just favors that. It's very marginal. It doesn't happen very often, but um, the only time I would split fives is with the two and the 12 tile. So if this is what you're dealt, if you keep the pair together, you have a, the lowest ranking pair there and a four point hand there. Granted it's a high four, but still four points is not very good. If you split them apart, you now have seven and seven, and they're both high sevens. Um, you'll have to take my word for it that the odds favor splitting in this situation. Tess, have you ever seen a player split fives? I have not. And I don't think I have ever actually had this hand, and I've played a lot of Pi Gal, but did some it has to be this exact situation and getting it is not very likely. My advice about splitting a pair of sixes, like this one, is only to make seven, eight, or better. And that's only going to happen with some combination of the two tile, the 12 tile, and the 11 tile. For example, um, if these are the four tiles you have, um, you could play pair three, but I would argue the odds favor playing it like this as an eight seven. Uh, and it's a, it's a very marginal decision if you never um, split sixes at all. Um, the loss in expected value in the whole game is going to be very, very marginal. Nevertheless, you know what a perfectionist I am and I try to make the right play every time. Um, it's not what the house would do, but um, the house way was developed um, over hundreds of years and um, before the advent of computers and computer technology has just showed that the house way is just not always right. Um, so that's when to split sixes. Um, splitting sevens, you would only do to make a hand of seven seven or better. For example, if your other two tiles were um, two non-matching tens. With eights, you would split eights to make a eight or better, or if you had the nine and the 11 tile. Uh, with nine nine, again, it's, it's kind of easy. You would split nines only to make a hand of nine nine or better. Does, do you have any um, huge disagreements with that, Tess? No, I agree with that. Okay, well yes. that's good to know. So I think, okay, we, so we didn't talk about when to split um, 
the team pair and the day pair. You would only split these to make six, eight, or better. Uh, for example, if you were dealt the team pair and, um, and you had these two, you could play this as a um, high pair and a zero if you wanted to, but I would argue your value is much better off by splitting them apart and playing it eight six. What's the house's strategy on that, Tess? We also play six eight or better. Yep. Yes. Okay. And it doesn't matter whether it's the teen or day. Only split them to form six eight or better. I think there's only one pair left to talk about. The highest pair, the Guy June pair. Uh, you'll almost never split this apart and it's heartbreaking to do it because you know it can't be beat. Nevertheless, if the other two tiles are both sixes, a six and a five, or a six and a four, then the odds favor splitting them apart. And let's look at an, an example. So if this is what you were dealt, um, you could play the high pair here, but here you've only got zero. Um, so that's almost a guaranteed push. You, if you split them apart, you've got nine points here and um, seven points here. So seven nine is a strong hand. It's, it's stronger than average. So the odds would definitely favor splitting the Gi June um, in that situation. And again, if the other two tiles are six and six, six and five, or six and four. Tess, what's the house's strategy on splitting Gi June? Uh, four, six, five, six, 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 eight. So, okay, we're in 100% agreement there. We are. Um, and if you can't remember all this, don't worry about it. With any hand, you can always ask the dealer, what is the house way or what would you do? And the house way for the splitting pairs is, is very close to the optimal strategy for splitting pairs. So I wouldn't hesitate to take the dealer's advice um, when it comes to the pairs. Any, any questions on splitting pairs, Heather? Uh, do you split the pairs that don't match to the same as you do the other pairs? Yes, okay. yes. So for example, with the rule with splitting eights, it's to make eight, eight or better, or with a nine and 11, and it doesn't make any difference whether it's the low eight pair or the high eight pair. Okay, awesome. Yeah, you explained everything great, thank you. You're welcome. Next, let's talk about the strategy when you can make a Wong, a Gong, or a High Nine. And I don't think I've defined a High Nine yet. A High Nine is any nine-point hand that is composed of one of these two highest ranking tiles, uh, so, and a seven. So that would be a High Nine, or this would be a High Nine, um, or you could switch them around. Again, you're looking for those nine point totals, but with a, with a high ranking tile as a kicker. As a good rule of thumb, if you can't make a pair, then check your hand uh, for the possibility of a Wong, Gong, or a High Nine. And that's easy to do. Um, just look for these two tiles. As a good rule of thumb, and there are exceptions for the advanced strategies, if you can only make a High Nine gong or wong one way, then make it whatever the other hand is. Um, however, sometimes you'll have both of these tiles um, and let's say that you have the, um, no that's a bad example. Let's say you can make a wong, a high nine, and let's just say the other tile is this 11. Um, so here you can make a Wong or a high nine. Which should you do? The, sometimes it's obvious. And this rule carries to Pai Gao, to every situation in Pai Gao. If there's one way to play the tiles that is superior to all other ways in both the high and the low, then that is exactly what you should do and that's that's the case here with any four tiles there are three possible ways you can play it in this case we could play Wong 8 
we could combine, we could play high nine, zero, or we could play three, six. Um, playing this Wong eight is superior to everything else in both the high and the low, therefore it's obvious. And this rule will carry you through a lot of hands. I mean, probably about 40%. You know, it comes up a lot, these obvious situations. Same as in Pi Gow Poker. A lot of hands are obvious, but some of them you have to choose whether to play conservatively or um, by balancing or have one high and one low. So, um, but let's say that instead of this 11, let's say that we had a 5. So here we could play uh, Wong 2. Or we could play 9-4. How would the house do that one, Tess? We would play the 4 and the 9. Okay, that's not what I would do. And um, like I said before, I don't always agree with the house way. Um, one rule I have is that if you can play a Wong and the other hand is 2 or less, then that's how you should play it. My thinking is that if you play this as a 9-4, I don't like 4s in the low. I like to get my low at least up to 5. So if I can't get this at least to a 5, I'm going to say to heck with the low. I'm going to uh, make my high as best as possible and play it that way. It's a marginal situation. Most of the time when you're put into a situation where you can play high 9, gong, and wong um, two or more different ways, um, most of the time you should you should you should balance the hands namely playing the high nine first if you can't then the wong and then the gong but this is just an exception to that rule so while we're on the topic of the high nines gongs and wongs another situation that you see a lot is um something like this so we have a high nine two different ways. We can play it like that, or we can combine the seven with the two tile. Um, in this situation, um, the odds favor uh, making that nine as high as you can. And the reason is, is this game sees a lot of nines in the high hand. So if you get to nine points in the high hand, you really want to kick up that kicker um, as high as you possibly can. Therefore, um, um, this is how I would recommend playing a high nine if you have both the teen and the day tile. Your thoughts, Tess? I agree with that. Okay, so um, again, the main rule of thumb is that high nine beats a gong or should be played before a gong, and a gong should be played before Wong, except if the low, if, except if in doing so, um, the, um, the low hand is less than a, uh, a four or five, then I would sacrifice the low and make the high hand as high as possible. And again, uh, the strategy is all uh, explained much better on my website in writing. Um, uh, do you have anything to add to that, Tess? No, that's quite a lot, yes. Yeah, I know yes. it's a lot to digest. Any questions, Heather? Uh, I'll let you know if I can't digest any of it. <laughs> 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 okay, um, so next we will talk about um, how to play the many situations where you don't have a pair and you don't have a high nine, gong, or wong. Much of the time, you're not going to be able to make a pair, a wong, gong, or high nine. And in that case, my basic strategy is I try to get the low hand to at least a five. Um, if I can, then I balance the hands, meaning that I play them, that I try to maximize the low hand. If I can't get that low hand to at least a, 
a five, then I'm going to sacrifice the low hand and make my high hand as good as possible. Um, except if I can't get my high hand to at least a seven, then I'm gonna think this hand is just so awful that I'm gonna go back to balancing it. Um, and this is similar to the, the house way, except the house only needs to get to what's called a high three or better um, to be satisfied in balancing. Um, I'm a little more aggressive. I tried to get it to the five, and you might ask, what is a high three? A high three is, um, it's this one that um, is the critical one, right? Correct. So, um, so this and a seven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the house is going to try to get to this in order to balance. Um, and they call it a, a high three. Also a chong three. Yes. yes, yes. So just remember this tile is the one that you need to get to three points and at least this tile for the high. And um, I know that went by kind of fast, but I think it would help if we just played some random hands um, to show you some examples. Shall we do that, Heather? Yes, definitely. Yes. Okay. So Tess has uh, mixed up the tiles, so Heather place a bet, and as I explained in part one, we're playing this on a felt for a different table because we didn't have a pie gal layout available, but there's just one bet to make, so we'll just um, put it there. So the dealer shakes the dice to determine um, where the first um, set of tiles is delivered to. Okay, and um, once, once the dealer, okay. Well, let's just turn and face up, although you wouldn't see this actually at the table. So I'll go over my hand first. Um, so this is going to fall under that. Hmm. So I could play. I could, if I played it like this, it would be five and three. So my three is not making it all the way up to the five point. So I am going to try to make the high hand as high as possible, which I already am. Um, and I, like I said, I tried to get to a seven, which I do. So I am going to play this seven, three. Um, how would you play this one, Tess? I would imagine you would play um, four, six. Four and a six. Yeah, yes. so this is just some place where I differ with the house way. And when you're actually at the table, uh, put your, once you're done, just put both hands in, in two separate tiles like that. Okay, Heather, let's see what you have. Oh my goodness, so this is the situation we were just talking about um, where you can play both a, a nine or a gong. Did I do it right? So let's see. Was I listening? Um, let, let's see. Um, so this way here you have it as um, nine five. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with that. Do you, Tess? I agree with that. Okay. That's Super five. Call <laughs> that one. <laughs> All right, six and nine. So let's go over kind of slowly for the camera um, how, how you adjudicate this. So um, you can see that you both have nines in the high, which, like I said before, happens a lot. So it goes to the high tile to break that tie. So Heather wins in the high. In the low, Heather has five, but you have six. So Tess, you win the low, so it goes so one and one, so it's a push. push. Okay. And I lost. Yes. Shall we try a third hand, Heather? Yeah, let's Okay, give it a place shot. your bet, and I recommend $25 for a reason I'll explain later. You're going uh, with the position of the dice, so whatever the number of dice is, is what position you start at? Yes, okay. correct. Cool. Okay, so once she's done, you can check your tiles. And let's just flip them over for the audience. Uh, the way I like to do it is to put the tiles in um, order from highest to lowest. Mm -hmm. And then usually I see what it looks like if I match the highest and lowest. So here I have seven five. 
um, I already know that I like that. Like I said before, I tried to get the low to at least a five, which I did here. So, um, yeah, this this feels right to me. Um, so, yeah, six, seven. Heather, let's see what you have. Okay, um, yeah, this is obvious. Um, you should play that uh, long nine. Which is those, okay. Yes. So basically the only one I didn't pick was the one I should have picked. <laughs> right. so, so remember these are special. Always check for these and you try to combine them with a seven, eight or nine. And remember these are semi wild. They can worth, be worth three or six. So in this situation, uh, we are keeping it just as a three, six plus three is nine. Okay, so the dealer has nine zero. So you win. Oh, yay. And I pushed because the dealer uh, nine, uh, beat my hand. So now, okay, so this gives me an opportunity to talk about the commission. You may remember before that I said the commission is 5%. 5% mm -hmm. of $25 is $1.25, but the casinos, either because they're nice, they round it down to a dollar, or maybe the reason is they just don't want any quarters on the table and it would look cheap to make you pay two dollars, rounding it up. Um, so twenty-five dollars is, is a nice amount to bet at this table because it cuts down the uh, commission actually to four percent. Cool. So, um, so let's try another hand and this time let's watch uh, the procedure of... Um, the shuffle? Yes, the shuffle. Yes. And you're watching the tiles, right? You're playing around. Now, they were watching the tiles before they started washing the cards, right? So when Correct. you wash the cards on the table, we're actually mimicking a pie gal tile. Yes, right. they are. Awesome. Yes, a lot of gambling stems from uh, pie gal. Why did you push that up? That's to indicate for surveillance and for the floor supervisors that that's the first hand going out. Okay, and is it called anything else? Houseway. Head of the Dragon? Head of the Dragon, yes. Wow. Okay, the dealer's done, so we can check our tiles. So again, I like to put them in order and then see what it looks like comparing the highest with the lowest. So that results in three. This results in five. I really don't like playing at three, five. Like I said before, I try to get the low up to a five if I can. I couldn't. So now I'm going to see what it looks like com uh, playing the high as high as possible, which is this way, uh, meaning seven, one. So uh, this is how I would play it. Um, I think, and you would play it this way too, uh, because the uh, playing the high three. The house would play three and five on that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, a, a disagreement with me with the house, um, but I'm sure it's fairly close. both ways Heather and um, yeah the dealer had a strong hand okay Heather before we play our next hand let me talk about the importance of banking as I mentioned in part two um, I mean part one in the event that the high tile does not break a tie then whoever is banking wins um, wins that face off and who who is banking you might ask well um, the turn to bank rotates around the table um, 
Some places it zigzags, but most places it rotates. And most players decline the option to bank. Um, uh, but when I play, especially if I'm playing by myself, I invoke my right to bank um, every single time, assuming that it's not going to cause any w ill will with the other players, which I'll talk more about later. But when you're playing head-to-head -head with the dealer, you can bank every other hand. And, and banking is valuable. Um, it cuts the house advantage um, significantly by an amount that I will um, explain a little bit later. Uh, so, um, yeah, let's go on to the next hand, please, Tess. Okay, would you like to bank? Yes, please. All right, Mike, there you go. And uh, I forgot to bring a proper banking chip, so we're using the lens cap for my camera. Would you like to cut the tiles, Mike? Okay. Um, there, this is something we're going to talk about in part three, the um, miscellaneous topics about Pi Gao, but there's various ways you can, um, what's called cut the deck or cut the tiles. I don't even know what this is called, but that's what I do and the dealers know what I mean. It's called Zhong Kua. It means take the heart. Okay. Yes. Uh, I did not know that. And notice how Tess let me shake the dice. If you're banking, you get to do that, but only shake them. Do not lift up the lid as I did the first time um, I ever banked. And uh, one of my other pet peeves in Pai Gao um, is when players, and 100% of the time it's an Asian player, they just really slam that cup on the table. I don't know why they have to do that. Just a nice gentle shake is my style. That will do, 18. Oh, we forgot to make our bets, Heather? No, um, you were banking a minute ago. You're right. <laughs> and that brings up yet another topic. How much am I betting when uh, I'm banking? Mm -hmm. If you're playing just against the dealer, the dealer will bet against you whenever you bet her against her the last time. Now, in this situation, there's another player at the table, Heather. So I am going to be banking. Both of you are going to be playing against me. Uh, much like um, the previous hand both of us played against Tess. So, uh, um, it's, it's, uh, if it's not a rule, it's common courtesy that the banker should wait for the um, other players to act. And normally, I would be a gentleman and not look at their tiles, but since this is a demonstration, <laughs> I'm going to see what you have. Please. Okay, it doesn't, okay. So, nice hand, Heather. So, yep. Yep, so definitely keep that pair together because ah. the alternative is not very good. Gotcha. Okay. Now, okay, I also have a pair. Um, like I said before, the rule for splitting two sevens is to make seven seven or better, which I can't do. Um, if I split these, I would just have three one. So I'm going to keep my uh, mixed seven pair together, and I have. Um, only one in the low. So a likely push against Tess. And now Tess will look at hers. Four and six. Mike has one in a pair, so we push. Now Mike goes against Heather. Heather has four in a bigger pair, so Mike pays Heather 25. Right? So I, um, it's proper etiquette to um, give the money to the dealer, and then the dealer gives it to the winning player, and then the player would pay the commission to the dealer, not the banking player. Correct. Okay. So you say it's good to bank because it's very... Um, it's an advantage for the player, mm -hmm. but you said there were some times where it's not good to do it. Um, what were you talking about? What Could you tell me a little more about what you were saying? Okay, this is a very delicate subject. Um, let me repeat that if you're playing head-to-head -head with the dealer, always accept your turn to bank. It gets more sensitive when there's other players at the table. Um, I hope I won't offend anyone in saying that Asian players can be very superstitious. And if the game has been going well and you join the table and start asking to bank, 
they're not going to like it. I can 99% guarantee you they're not going to like it. They're going to say things were going just fine with the dealer banking. Don't mess up a good thing. Total superstition, but um, that's the conventional thinking. So if I am joining a table and other players are already there, I'm going to feel like the newcomer and I'm going to defer to the table if they mind me banking. So when it comes my turn, I am going to ask the other players, do you mind if I bank? And sometimes they will be kind of polite about it, like they probably don't want you to, but they don't want to be rude and say no. So here is where you really have to feel the tone of their voice, how they say no, gestures, things like that. Feel them out. Um, I, you know, when I, I don't make any claims to having an advantage in Pi Gal. So when I play, I'm playing for fun. So I don't want to cause any ill will at the table. That's just me. Some people will fight for an advantage every place they can get. Um, so um, if, if the other players don't want me to bank, I'm not going to, you know, that's, that's just how I am. However, if I was at the table first and other players join in, I'm still going to ask but if I feel like it's a borderline situation, I'll be a little bit more aggressive about the banking because I kind of feel that I was here first. You know, um, you know, there's just kind of this attitude in, in I think, all table games. Um, for example, if you're smoking, um, I think that if you join a table where there's already people smoking, you have no right to complain about it. But if a non-smoker starts a table by himself, and a smoker joins in, I am gonna do the big old fan, believe me. <laughs> um, so that's, that's my feeling about it. Any questions? I really wanna see you do the fan one day. I wanna go there and I wanna see you do that. I promise you, I will do that for you. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Okay, so Tess, deal us another hand, All please. Right. And by the way, Tess is dealing because it's her turn because I did it last time and it rotates this way. Okay, remember this is can be worth three or six points. Um, the way I'm going to play this, remember I try to get my low to at least a five. Um, if I play it like this, I can play 5-6, so my low is good enough, um, so that is my decision. Okay, so Heather, you could either play this as long 1 or 9-3. What do you suggest? I like long 1. I believe I said um, that if you can play a long and the low is a zero, one, or a two, that's what you should do. What's your opinion, Tess? Also the one long. Okay. The three is not big enough for us to play the nine, we go one long. Okay, so the house also follows the high three rule in that situation? Correct. Okay, okay so we agree there. All right. Two and three. Mm -hmm. Nice Very for nice. us. <laughs> one long, oh, you play long. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's awesome. All right, I don't I have any to In all seriousness, mm -hmm. though, you did play it right. Okay. And as I always say, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, it's whether or not you made the right bet. And in this case, the odds favoring doing what you did. So, uh, what's after all of this, after everything we've done, um, about what's the house advantage on this? What are the numbers on this? Good question. What is the bottom line to this whole complicated game? And it all depends on how strong your strategy is and whether you're uh, banking or not banking. Now, on my website, I have what's called JV, Simple Strategy. A guy named, uh, with the initials JV, used to work for me and uh, helped me with a lot of high gal uh, analysis, and he created I asked him to make a fairly simple strategy, and of course he made it more complicated than what I wanted. But nevertheless, um, 
created a pretty simple one and most elements of it I stated here already. That said, playing the JP simple strategy when you are not banking, when the dealer is banking or another player, you're going against a 1.9% house advantage. When you are banking, you enjoy a very low house advantage of just 0.1%. So if you are playing face up with the dealer and banking every other hand, the average house advantage is right at 1%, which compared to other casino games is quite good. Um, it's not the best, but it, it's, it's nice and low. Another great thing about Paigao is it's a slow game. So if you're looking for a slow game that does not have a lot of volatility, I think you just can't beat Paigao. Um, and I, you know, I think it's fun, it's challenging. It's, it's, for me, it's everything a casino game should be. So, so if you have the house edge on this game and you compare the house edge for this game to say Blackjack and Baccarat, mm -hmm. which one has the better one? Because aren't they all around 1% or is Baccarat a little bit less than 1%? So Blackjack depends upon um, the rules of the game, but as long as the Blackjack pays 3 to 2 and never play if it doesn't, then the house advantage is going, is going to be less. It's, it's going to be anywhere from about... 0.8% to 0.2%, depending upon all the other rules. Um, Baccarat, the house advantage is higher. It's 1.06% on the banker bet and 1.23% on the player bet. So um, it's it's um, Baccarat. It's better than Baccarat, but not as not as good as blackjack. And um, craps is also better if you stick to um, the um, all the best bets, namely just uh, line bets and taking full odds. Uh, you might ask, um, what if I don't uh, uh, memorize your uh, JB simple strategy? What if I just play the same way the dealer does, known as the house way? Um, there the house advantage is, is higher. Um, the JB simple strategy is simpler than the house way, and it cuts down the house advantage by 0.48%, or almost a half a percent. And, and in the casino, every hundredth of a percentage point matters. So that's a lot. So um, serious students of the game, I, I highly recommend you check the resources on my website. Um, optimal strategy. There's very few people on this planet that get close to optimal strategy or even within 99.9%. .9%. And I do not consider myself one of them. But I know people who are. They just seem to know every single hand. And um, the house advantage there is 0.27% lower than, um, than with JB's simple strategy. Yeah, 0 0.27. So there you have it. It's in terms of um, the odds, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the better games to play. Do you have anything to add to that, Tess? Come out and play it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and would you agree it's a pretty slow game? Like, what's the average number of hands per hour? Oh my, I wouldn't even know. It is very slow. Yeah, though. it's it's yeah. it's probably I at most 60, thirty. Sixty, I think. No, well, it might be thirty. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like thirty to forty, depending yeah. upon the number of other players. So, um, yeah, if you're looking for a good challenge, um, I think Pi Gal will give that to you. So I would say that concludes this part two on the strategy for Pi Gal. I know I didn't cover all of it. Um, thanks to Heather for uh, being my student and the videographer, Tess for being the dealer. Thank you to Galaxy Gaming for letting me use their studio. And in part three, we're going to um, talk about some of the more miscellaneous points to Pi Gal that won't necessarily improve your game, but just some things you may be wondering about, and especially the um, players that already know how to play.